Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct by construction, concurrent, scalable solution, our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative of planet. Please join us on this journey. Okay, welcome everyone to our newest iteration of the Archain Climate and Coordination Arcast. Um, this week, there's a lot to talk about. Um, and I had planned at first to discuss um, some different sort of, not really climate news, but more innovations. And then <laughs> some really um crazy stuff happened that is a little bit more i feel uh urgent to discuss um so the first thing because anytime this sort of thing happens i feel like it's important just to um bear witness to what's going on in the world because the news cycle now is just the modern news cycle is there's 24 hours of just total um jam-packed information and we don't often hear these important stories so this is from yahoo news um but i I believe it's reposted from reuters and this is a story about the hurricane iota um and i i was seeing on twitter people were posting about this horrible flooding in central america And I wanted to just explain to people what's going on because I haven't seen much of this in the news. I know that the Philippines also has been really suffering from terrible flooding. And hopefully they've gotten that a little bit more under control. But I'll just read this here because this has just been happening basically since yesterday. It says Storm Iota unleashed torrential floods in Central America this week, forcing tens of thousands to flee their homes with a death toll feared to be over 20 by Wednesday morning, bringing winds of nearly 155 miles per hour, which is extremely fast. Iota struck the coast late on Monday, inundating villages still reeling from the impact of Hurricane Ada two weeks ago. So these poor people are trying to just recover from their first hurricane just two weeks ago, and now they have another one. It says Iota, which hit as a Category 4, was the strongest storm on record ever to hit Nicaragua. So this is a really big deal. Um, It says here, uh, by Tuesday night, the winds had fallen to 50 miles per hour as Iota weakened to a tropical storm. But authorities across Nicaragua and Honduras were still battling to cope with devastating flooding on Wednesday. And then this was posted on Thursday, the day after, just so you know. Um, It says six people in Nicaragua and three others across Central America and the Caribbean had been confirmed dead by Tuesday evening. Nicaraguan media said that a landslide had killed at least 15 other people in the north of the country. And it says in total about 100,000 Nicaraguans and Hondurans had been evacuated from their homes. So the reason I wanted to bring it up is just because, first off, it's the strongest, it says it's the strongest um, storm ever to hit Nicaragua. That's an extremely important fact to note. Also, just that 100,000 people have been evacuated and it's not really making the news. Um, So now we have these huge climate disasters um that are breaking records but also just like the amount of resources and coordination it takes to evacuate a hundred thousand people i would imagine is pretty immense and you know we're still not we're still not hearing about it um 
I'm just wondering like what it takes to break through the news cycle. Um, anyway, so it says at the end here, the U.S. National Hurricane Center said the storm's remnants could trigger life-threatening flash flooding, river flooding, and mudslides across parts of Central America through Thursday. So this was posted. Um, this was posted uh, Wednesday. And I'm seeing on Thursday on Twitter, it, there was a lot of stories and videos of this horrible flooding. And um, I can pause for some comments here if anybody wants. But this really connects to the second story that I found, um, which is even more <laughs> surprising. But I'll pause in case anybody has anything to say about this um, situation. Well, I'll say guilty as charged. I didn't... Uh... I didn't uh, pick this up in my news feed um, either. Um, it's, Isn't uh, that surprising? Yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, I guess, people are focused on something else right now. Uh, but it's like 100,000 people have to leave their homes. I don't know. It just seems to me like this is pretty serious, you know? Yeah, the strongest storm ever to hit Nicaragua. You'd think that would make the news. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Bizarre. And, you know, if you and I are not really hearing about it, then it's like, who would be hearing about it? You know, because we generally try to read about these things, you know, on a regular basis. I just I just try to put myself in 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 the, in, in the shoes of someone who had just dealt with Ida. And then now this happens. I, I can't comprehend the kind of challenge on uh, staying positive that would occur. Uh, man, you know, like talk about, you know tough tough goings i know yeah yeah so we really need to send our good wishes and whoever can hopefully there'll be some good places to donate and but yeah i mean we can't just keep doing this all the time so this is the second story i have this is from cnbc i was going to talk about something else but then this popped up on the 18th also day before yesterday and i was like oh my god we have to talk about this because it's also about um flooding and i was also just surprised to see this in cnbc um because it's really you know really a climate type story but anyway it says here 2020 hurricane season is the busiest ever recorded and the national flood insurance program faces over 20 billion with a b dollars in debt <laughs> so <laughs> it says here the 2020 hurricane season has had 29 named storms which i mentioned before i think last week or the week before that means that it's you know the the bit it says the busiest one i don't know if it's the deadliest one but it certainly seems to be the one with the most storms it says one inch of flood water can cause up to twenty five thousand us dollars in damage according to fema and so i'm reading about this and trying to understand what is going on? They interviewed this guy called Kurt Dyer. He experienced, it says, three major floods in his home in Miami, valued at over $1 million. Um, apparently, this program, I looked on Wikipedia to understand what this program is, the NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program. And this is a really interesting situation. So this is not just, this is not like, earthquakes, tornadoes, fires. This is just for flooding. It says the NFIP is designed to provide an insurance alternative to disaster assistance to meet the es escalating costs of repairing damage to buildings and their contents caused by floods. So obviously flooding is one of the most, it says in the, in the article that flooding is, is really one of the most costly, um, items, uh, to repair um, when it, when you have a hurricane or a natural disaster, um, sometimes it's not just the wind or you know whatever. It's really the flooding that comes after that's usually the most costly. It says as of August 2017, the program insured about five million homes, um, the majority of which are in Texas and Florida. The cost of the insurance program was fully covered by its premiums until the end of 2004. And then it's had to steadily borrow funds since then, primarily due to Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. Of course, those were, you know, um, really serious storms in um, 
New Orleans, and then also Sandy was in uh, New York. It says it accumulated $25 billion of debt by August 2017, so obviously they had a lot of claims. But then in October of 2017, Congress canceled $16 billion of that debt, making it possible for the program to pay its claims. So apparently it couldn't even pay its claims until at least half of this debt was canceled. But now the NFIP owns owes sorry 20 over 20 billion 20.5 billion dollars uh of debt as of december 2019 so that's actually even without this 2020 season that's just through last the end of last year so you know we're in a situation now when the insurance can't even keep up with what's going on and anybody who has ever tried to buy a house in california or knows someone who's bought a house in california knows that the insurance for fire on on homes in California is now almost cost prohibitive um, to buying a home. And even for people who are extremely wealthy, it's just a waste of money they would rather rent than buy in, you know, in some cases. And also it's becoming very hard to sell homes because if you sell a home that the insurance is very high on, people want to buy the house, but they don't want to get the insurance with it. Um, and I think that would be connected to this, um, this story. So there's, it goes on to talk about how this program is, you know, functioning. The, the senior executive of the NF, NFIP says it's functioning and operating as it was designed. I don't think they designed to be $20 billion in debt. Um, that would be my guess. It says here, meanwhile, private insurance companies are starting to expand their flood insurance offerings. All of this provides interesting incentives for Americans living in a potentially risky area. Yeah, in interesting incentives. Um, you know, I mean, people just have to pay so much money now. So this is just one kind of, I guess this is the flood week. Um because these two stories really went together, and I guess it was just fate that they were published on the same day. So, yeah, does anybody have any comments on this calamity? Well, I'd say that uh, when insurance companies go broke, you know that you have an unprecedented problem <laughs> that's never happened before. It's uh, like, what's what clearer evidence do you need? <laughs> Um, wow! Yeah, that's incredible. Well, I, I I think the what's been coming to my mind as you've been talking about this is, you know, a lot of people personify um, the year 2020 because there's been so much calamity happening in 2020, and so they they personify it. Um, but the the real issue is that it's not. I, I hate to say it. I don't mean to sound like a naysayer, but um as climate change continues to roll in 2020 is going to look like a picnic and it's, it's, <laughs> we're, we're going to wish for the problems of 2020 <clears throat> yeah um and you know and it's kind of easy to laugh about it now until the calamities are all around us and, and it's uh it's more uh it, it becomes more serious right um so i yeah i just that's that's what I'm thinking about as you're reading this stuff, that, that this is only going to come more fast and more furious. And, um, you know, hold on to your hats. <laughs> yeah, one thing I'm really concerned about, and I obviously, in addition just to like, you know, being able to, you know, farm and human life, you know, all of these things, um, biodiversity. But another thing just for the economically minded people is like, how are you going to insure all these homes? You know what I mean? Like how, um, who's going to be able to afford the insurance on that? Because obviously the insurance for flooding is going to go way up. That's going to be, you know, all over the world. The insurance for fires is going to go up, you know, way up, had horrible fires in Argentina. Um, I believe in the last two, three weeks, there's been, like some of the most devastating fires ever in Argentina. Um, you know, so this stuff is like kind of like year round. And um, 
I just wonder how people are going to be able to pay to insure their assets, to insure their homes and insure their lives, because this is going to start becoming extremely expensive. And while the, um, the NFIP is not an actual insurance company, it's a, it's a program that was created by Congress, um, and it had to be bailed out because of the... Um, because of the devastation of these storms. Um, it just seems like, I don't know if there's a way for them to break even. So I wonder if, I mean, this is a really wild claim, but I wonder if it will end to like the dissolution of the insurance industry and something more like just government, like, you know, Medicare for all, how about like insurance for all or something like that because it just becomes so unfair to some people. Um, the costs are so high, and then the relief benefits so many people. If you've got 100,000, you know, climate refugees per storm, you know, the rebuilding efforts, you know, those are, there's no way that the private sector or that like, you know, just regular individual people could pay for all of that, especially if it's gonna be happening every month or several times a year, especially more than once in the same place in one month i mean that's insane how are they going to rebuild these places in nicaragua you know these towns and these stores and everything people can't be expected to just pay like people are going to grow go broke just paying for the you know the rehabilitation of their homes that's something that really surprised me and you know i or maybe insurance is just going to be something for the ultra wealthy and if you know people in the middle class and under just won't have it that's another possibility and then you know if insurance is even more privatized than it is now then you know possibly they'll have to decide you know what gets repaired and maybe these places that are hit by these calamities never really get fully repaired and i think that there's evidence of that already happening which is you know, not fair because, again, as we talked about like several weeks ago, these people that usually are hit worse by these climate disasters have done the least to bring them on. So, yeah, I think in 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 many cases the reason that crypto nomads uh, choose a nomadic lifestyle is. Uh, because they're aware of what's going to happen to the built infrastructure as climate change hits. Um, and not all of them have that the, that rationale, but that's in fact the... Um, I thought it was to ev evade uh, tax jurisdiction. As I said, not all of them have <laughs> that, that motivation, but some of them do. Well, I think that uh, it would definitely be a consideration if I were, well, yeah, anybody, yeah, at any age, um, the ability to kind of get up and move, I think is kind of probably going to be something that people are going to be more thinking about. Yeah. Don't get, don't get too locked into one place. Well, uh, I guess yeah. as climate changes, there are less habitable places and comparatively better habitable places so you get a lot of people moving around right that's that's correct oh. but unfortunately there may be people already in the places where people want to move to that's so that's that way, right yeah that's going to create a lot of conflict and or potential for conflict so it's yes we're in for a lot of fun <laughs> Yeah, so I just wanted to bear witness to all that because I just feel like it's really, I know it's sort of sad sometimes that it's <laughs> early in the morning and I just go in with these um, really devastating stories, but I think it's really important to talk about them and to realize that they're happening. And also just to realize that people are really suffering already from this and not everybody is as fortunate as we are uh, right now. Um, and because a lot of it really gets sort of swept under the rug um, and it's really easy to just not realize how much people are suffering already. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention it because I felt it was of spiritual and humanitarian uh, import, if you will. Um, but I know that Daryl has some more uh, questions. 
Um, and I know that we are also hoping that Steve Ross Talbot will get to join us. So, um, Daryl, was there anything you wanted to uh, speak about before Steve hopefully joins in? Yeah, there's kind of two different um, streams that I was thinking about uh, going to. Uh, one was to kind of revisit um, what we were talking about on October 30th's our cast, uh, which is connected to how the World Wide Web missed some important things and how blockchain missed some important things and how our chain addresses those important things. Uh, I, I, um, so that was one of the, the things I wanted to talk about. Um, and then the other one was um, uh, there yesterday I was raking some leaves and I was listening to an audiobook and um, the audiobook's called The Four by this guy named Scott Galloway and um, he was talking about something that uh, uh, I've been kind of talking about and I didn't realize there was anyone else talking about it from the same angle but he was kind of talking about um, comparing Facebook to the oil industry and um, um, I have an excerpt that I could play from that audiobook. Would you guys mind uh, maybe if we pause for about one minute and then I'll be able to hook up my system? It shouldn't take sure. long. Sure. How long is the excerpt? Uh, it's about five minutes. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. I'll just quickly do this. Hey, Greg, Interesting. If, if we have uh, on chain versus off chain in mm -hmm. the context of. Uh, large files or media. And the other yeah. question is about um, the, uh, the proof of stake, the interpretation of uh, permissionless, permissioned or permissionless proof of stake, where our chain fits into that continuum. Sure, sure, absolutely. So pick, um, pick whichever one you like. <laughs> Uh, we can we can probably do both. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just one note: I'm about to step in and grab a, a, a decaf coffee order that I placed online. So why don't you ask the question, and hopefully by the time the question is finished asking, I'll have grabbed my my stuff. Okay. So with proof of stake, um, the way our chain is set up right right now. Uh, at, at least the you know the, the root shard is is permissioned, but anyone no it's can... permissionless. Any anyone anyone can uh, submit uh, compute, right? That's permissionless. Anyone oh, I'm, I'm confused with the staking then. Yes, that's right. And um, anyone can join the shard. As long as they're, you know, put up the stake, so it's also permissionless from that perspective as well. Okay, so you can you can earn uh, transaction fees by by offering compute or storage or whatever, but it's just for the for the for the staking that it's okay. So let's talk about the staking then. So that is, uh, I mean, it has to be permissioned, and then for for every shard. Uh, different groups that decide what the criteria are to join. And then you have relationships between the shards, whether I'm going to accept uh, transactions from from other shards. Yes, that's correct. That's right. So, so the thing about um, our chain is that it spans the gamut. It's both, you know, you can, it can be as permissioned as you want uh, effectively, right? So it, it gives you the whole spectrum. So but when you classify the, our, the, the proof of stake, the Casper for, for our chain, I mean, you, you're, it still falls under permissioned. It falls under permissionless. Anyone can join a shard, but that's only yeah, but, if they know about the shard, right? So if, you, if, I, if someone launches a private shard, then they, they can't join that shard. Then other people can't join that shard. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but but back to the, the the staking. So the staking by nature is permission. I mean, not not anyone. No, anyone can anyone can submit a, a, a request to stake. 
a request to stake, but uh, but and then, the and then the, the only criteria for being let in is whether or not there's a a slot and they get the randomly chosen. Okay. Don't we also have criteria? Some shards might have criteria about uh, about um, uptime and uh, and bandwidth requirements, that kind of thing. Well, yeah, but that's built into the protocol. So um, validators may eject other validators. So if a validator can't keep up with the load, then the protocol allows them to eject them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now I'm thinking of the the uh, the POS requirements for each shard is uh is set up and agreed and agreed to how uh, it, it's only on the back end if the validator can't keep up then they can be ejected we you know uh, we don't we don't um it's very difficult to produce proof uh, a positive proof forward proof of you know some kind of sla agreement Okay, but for the uh, for the root shard, we we have to start with some uh, some requirements that have to be enforced, and wouldn't and couldn't those requirements be different on on uh, other shards? Yeah, the the requirements are different. Um, we leave open the possibility that that can be done as a part of the bonding request. But in the current implementation of the protocol, the bonding request contains no information um, about a, a proof of capability. It's only enforced on the back end. If you can't keep up, then you're kicked out. Okay. And how close? What what are the uh, what are the steps that Archain needs to get to the point where we can accept permissionless uh, staking? It is permissionless. So this is what I've been saying. The staking is permissionless. But currently, uh, the validate we, we don't have independent uh, validator hardware. Oh, oh, that's a different. I'm sorry, I misunderstood what your question is. Uh, the protocol is permissionless. The co-op has not been letting other validators in until we um, we have three things. One, um, last finalized state, and uh, that is being released uh, even as we speak. Two, block merge, uh, and it looks like the PRs for block merge are coming in um, even as we speak. <laughs> and three, um, an upgrade to the POS. So there's some things that we wanna fix in the POS. Uh, and that should happen with luck. That will happen uh, by the end of the year. So um, in in January, we will um, potentially, if if all goes well, we don't hit any any other uh, issues. Uh, in January, we will open it up to um, to allow external validators. But the the important thing, uh, the the reason I was confused about your question was because I thought you were asking about the protocol as opposed to, you know, our chain's current implementation. Right, gotcha. And so, uh, hopefully, by by January, anyone who wants to stake, uh, whoever they anyone are, who wants to anyone who wants to run hardware can can uh, issue a bonding request. Right, and that per they could be. There's no KYC. There's no no ID requirement. Nothing. Just uh, it's part of the protocol, right? It's part of the protocol. They can issue a bonding request. Now, of course. If they get ejected, that means that their stake is in, is frozen and and not doing anything until the next epic. They don't lose their stake, but it is frozen until the until the epic change. At which point they can withdraw their stake. All right, cool. And do you have a second for the uh, um, on chain versus off chain storage? Because, yeah, sure. But... You know, I get these questions about well, you know, if you're storing large media on chain then doesn't that become untenable uh for um for you know bloat bloating of the the blockchain gets too big uh no it doesn't and that was sort of the point that we were showing because all storage first of all we have last finalized state right so you only 
you only uh, download up to the last uh, finalized state. So if if um, large media is stored and then removed, uh, garbage collected, um, then you're only downloading what you download. Um, and then the second point is that typically you will arrange large repositories in their own shards so that um, you have shards that are, are um, primarily stored, storage shards. Storage shards, correct. Yeah. You'll have storage shards, you'll have compute shards, uh, and, gotcha. and a, a range of uh, other special purpose shards. Yes. Right. So I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I've got a data center that's just loaded with hard drives. I can, uh, um, I can become a validator offering basically storage and perhaps not a whole lot of compute. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. Good questions. Daryl, are you ready? Uh, yeah, this should work now if you guys are hearing me. Okay, here we go. Oil. If you drill for oil in certain Saudi Arabian fields, it's pretty simple. You stick a pipe in the ground, and the oil that bubbles to the surface is almost pure enough to pump straight into your car. These can't-miss drilling rigs bring up oil at about $3 per barrel. Even in a depressed market, that same oil sells for about 50 bucks per barrel. In the heart of America's growing gas belt, in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, a company haggles with a farmer for the mineral rights to his land, then drills deep into the earth, hoping to hit a certain type of shale. This company has invested in fancy equipment, with drills that can practically turn corners 10,000 feet underground. It's expensive. And if the company finds the shale, it has to surround it with an industrial production, shattering the rock, pumping in thousands of gallons of briny water, and capturing the natural gas that breaks free. This all costs more than the oil equivalent of $30 per barrel. Now, would it make sense for Aramco, Saudi Arabia's national oil company, to divert some of its resources to the fracking fields of western Pennsylvania? Of course not at least for economic reasons, it would give up about $20 per barrel of profit. Why do that? Facebook faces a similar question. The prime material, the oil, for Facebook is the billions of identities it is following and getting to know in ever greater detail. The easy money is on the sure things in its people portfolio. By comparison, Virtual reality goggles, curing death, laying fiber, self-driving cars, and other business opportunities represent much longer odds. If people make it clear with their clicks, likes, and postings that they hate certain things and love others, those people are easy to sell to. Clear as day. Easy as oil in Arabia. If I go into Facebook and click on an article about Bernie Sanders and love one about Chuck Schumer, the machine, expending almost no energy, can throw me in a bucket of liberal diehards. If it wants to devote a little more computing energy to the process, just to be extra sure, it can see that I have the term Berkeley in my bio. So it delivers me with great confidence into the tree hugger bucket. The Facebook algorithm then proceeds to send me more liberal pieces, and the company will make money as I click on them. Newsfeed visibility is based on four basic variables – creator, popularity, type of post, and date – plus its own ad algorithm. As I consume that content, whether it's think pieces from The Guardian, YouTube clips of Elizabeth Warren expressing outrage at something, or my random friend venting about politics, the algorithm knows what to feed me because it has pegged me as a progressive. But what about all the people who don't express their politics so clearly? How do you sell political stories to them? Many of them are probably moderates, because most people in America are. And they're a lot harder to figure out. For each one, the Facebook machine would need a much more sophisticated algorithm to analyze their friend network, movements, zip code, and the words they use, the news sites they visit. It's a lot of work. And it's less profitable. Moreover, after all the work, it's still not a sure thing, 
because each bucket of moderates to sell to advertisers is based not on direct signals from those individuals, but instead from a host of correlations. Those always come with mistakes. My neighborhood in Greenwich Village is as blue as they come. Only 6% voted for Trump. Pretty sure that means I'm not just living in a bubble, but a windowless padded cell. However, as far as windowless padded cells go, it's pretty nice. Moderates are hard to engage or predict. Picture a video with some guy in a cardigan sweater discussing, in a balanced tone, the pros and cons of free trade with Mexico. How many clicks would that get? Marketing to moderates is like fracking for gas. You only do it if the easier alternatives aren't available. Thus, we are exposed to less and less calm, reasonable content. So Facebook and the rest of the algorithm-driven media barely bothers with moderates. Instead, if it figures out you lean Republican, it will feed you more Republican stuff until you're ready for the heavy hitters, the GOP outrage, Breitbart talk radio clips. You may even get to Alex Jones. The true believers, whether from left or right, click on the bait. The posts that get the most clicks are confrontational and angry. And those clicks drive up a post's hit rate, which raises its rankings in both Google and Facebook. That in turn draws even more clicks and shares. In the best, worst, cases, we see them daily. The story or clip goes viral and reaches tens or even hundreds of millions of people. And we all step deeper into our bubbles. This is how these algorithms reinforce polarization in our society. We may think of ourselves as rational creatures, but deep in our brain is the impulse for survival. And it divides the world into us versus them. Anger and outrage are easily spiked. You can't help yourself but click on that video of Richard Spencer getting punched. Politicians may seem extreme, but they are just responding to the public. And the anger we are working up daily in our news feeds, our march to one extreme. Yeah, so that's kind of the end of that little chunk of the excerpt. Um, so, so the thing that just kind of, um, you know, I find just, I think, I think the analogy is to me really powerful, right? The idea that, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, the oil they get is easily obtained. It's pure. It doesn't have to be refined as much. It's just easy money. Um, uh, Facebook, um, you using its, uh, plundering of resource uh, also goes for the easy money so the uh, and the easy money is polarized extreme beliefs um, now if they want to even make more money they do what Hoshana Zuboff calls engineered behavior modification uh, he's getting at it when he's talking about how if you're um, you know one particular uh leaning they they start you off with a few little little kind of milder somewhat more moderate news stories and then if you kind of click on the more extreme ones then you get more extreme ones and you end up at alex jones and and that's literally what's happened uh so um you know to me i just to me it's just clearly obvious that a big 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 part if not the biggest part of the massive polarization that's going on in the U.S. and, and everywhere else is, is directly connected to Facebook. And I don't think that's an extreme statement. I think it's like literally one of the biggest problems in the world. Because if we don't solve the Facebook problem, we're not going to solve the climate change problem. So anyway, that's... There's, a, there's another... Right. There's a fun point about Facebook that I heard recently uh, in listening to an interview between Tristan Harris, who's the head of the Center for Humane Technology, and, uh, and Rogan, where Tristan Harris was talking about Facebook insiders joking about uh, what country's governance is going to fail next being correlated with which country 
uh, which uh, country just got cell phone plans that include Facebook free basics. So if you're in one of these countries, usually developing countries, and you get a cell phone plan that includes Facebook free basics, that means that you're gonna, that your, your data on Facebook and Facebook applications is all included, it's all free. Whereas any other websites you go to, you're gonna have to pay for your data. So they oh, get wow. pretty hooked onto the Facebook pretty, pretty quick. Holy. And then, the, and then the Facebook, you know, AI very quickly spins up its outrage machine to increase whatever they're looking for on that day, whether it be engagement, which is mostly what you're talking about, or growth, which means, you know, influencing people to enlist their, their friends onto the platform, or revenue, which is just, you know, they crank up the dial and, uh, you know, get, get, you, uh, get some more advertisement in front of you. So they have pretty granular control. And in your piece that you're playing, it, it, it sounded like, you know, the, looking into somebody's background, see if they went to Berkeley. I mean, all this stuff is done uh, uh, automatically and by, by AIs. And we don't, I doubt if Facebook even knows all of the little things that, that go into uh, the, the, the profiles being created by, by the AIs. Yeah. 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 And well, Tristan Harris is so cool. And I'm so glad you brought him up because he was um, part of that film, A Social Dilemma, which is on Netflix, which I highly recommend our community to watch. Um, yeah, his, his, he, he created the, that film. That's uh, his work. Oh, OK. Yeah. I knew he was in it, but I wasn't sure exactly the extent. Yeah. So, OK. So, yeah, that was a really great film. And um, also a little bit of a drama as well, which I think people were a little bit struck by, but actually the drama has a, a very important point, an important role in the documentary. So, but yeah, it's really, um, it's uh, one thing I'm like reminded about, like um, the uh, president elect love saying that Joe Biden recently said, well, he's been saying it quite often that like the idea or the um, the choice to disagree with people from across the aisle, for example, but this could be outside of politics too. The choice to do that can also be a choice to work together. Like the idea that we shouldn't work together, that's something that we decided. And we can also decide to work together. And that's something I really think about when it comes to the climate crisis, when it comes to social media is like all this stuff like didn't just fall from the sky, you know, um, it's not just random that it happened. It was created through a series of choices by people, you know, by humankind. And if we can do that, then we can choose to fix it, you know, yeah. um, which I think is really important. And also I completely forgot to mention, I wanted to say this on this call, speaking of coordination, uh, I just wanted to, um, say I thought it was so cool to see the four astronauts um, that made it to the International Space Station. It was a SpaceX and NASA partnership. And um, you can watch them launch and watch them on their journey. Um, I'm pretty sure they have it live uh, on YouTube if, if people are interested in watching that because that happened within the last week and it was a very historic event. But I see that Steve Ross Talbot is here. I am, yeah. I've just dipped out for the last 10 minutes because <clears throat> I wanted to just join this call. Um, oh, great. Well, how are you doing? Well, it's been a, the most amazing day. Um, the list, which I think I've shared with you, Nora, of the participants and what they were talking about um, is a very esteemed list. And, and in particular, the uh, photo that I've shared of the participants talking about communication of COVID-19. You, you could substitute COVID-19 in every case for climate change, right? Another crisis, so two crises running concurrently at different speeds, albeit, but concurrently. Um, and it, you know, it's dawned on me as we've been, as it's played out um, through these very esteemed people that were convened and well over 500 participants, largely from, you know, epidemiology, journalism, broadcasting, um, uh, you know, and science, largely, um, with, a f with very, very few techies like me there. Um, 
so Dr. Frank Arnold's there, Kit Byers is there, who, who are doctors that do that deal with asylum seekers and torture victims as examples. Amongst this plethora of people, um, the general feeling is, um, as I asked one of my questions, and the other one may have got answered by now, don't know, um, but it was about the need for some kind of fabric, some kind of platform to enable global collaboration in a way where data, uh, the control of data is not lost by the individual, but is actually facilitated by the individual. So you have individuals owning their privacy um, and able to change what you want to see. Think of it like a diamond where every facet has a key and you give whatever key to whichever facet to who you choose as an individual. And that's really important for COVID for both the passport, um, the vaccination passport, but also for the test data so that you can track. And the same, you know, you could change that for uh, any event that's, that, that, that is evidence, yet more evidence, more of like we need more evidence of climate change. So it, I began to think towards the end that, you know, if we can put together something, which we're trying to do in our chain, that could be attractive in this situation, this COVID-19 situation, we could create that fabric. So, you know, we've got a platform, we've got our chain, but we could create that platform for collaboration. The very thing that the very reason we're in our chain could actually manifest itself on the back of a pandemic. And one of the speakers said, um, uh, it, it was a, he's a journalist, um, I think he was the person in the programme that was the only person speaking. So there would be one where there's a chair and one person speaking only. He's a journalist, broadcaster, has written some books about this stuff. And he actually said, one of the problems with COVID viruses um, is very much our um, desperate hunger for protein, for animal protein. Um, and, you know, and I hear that sometimes in climate change circles that, you know, sustainability uh, and the role of animals um, and animal protein in our diets as fueling that. And yet he's mentioning it from the perspective of we've made it easier for the transmission of um, animal viruses, COVID coming from bats, um, uh, because of our hunger for protein and the fact that we do not have really good provenance for um, animal protein. I just thought that tie in at the, you know, at the end of it was, was, was amazing from, from one of the journalists. So it's been pretty eye opening. Um, facts and figures are terrible. <laughs> that's another story. So that's it so far. Wow, that's amazing. That sounds like quite a day you've had out there. It is, you know, in between doing other jobs as well. But yes, it's, it's you know, it's enlightening. And, and the, the fact that, I mean, oddly enough, every question I asked, there's a moderator that says, I will ask your question live. Uh, but of course, it's like a flight, you know, that you're, you're on standby for and you're hoping that there's a spare seat and there might not be one. Um, so your questions are on standby and it doesn't mean they'll get asked, but they're in a list. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not uh, based on the time, the, po the point at which you asked, because I, I know that it's not. <laughs> I did that experiment with one of the questions. Um, so I didn't get all of my questions asked, but I did get some. And when I said about, I, the, when they asked the question, when I asked the question about this platform, for a you know, global platform enables us to have this passport that's controlled in this self-sovereign way. Um, uh, uh, and the guy answered, said, yeah, that would be, yeah, that's really what we need, blah, 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 blah. Guy from Hong Kong um, uh, and with the panelists agreeing. I actually then just sent another message to everybody, everybody, all the participants and the panelists and said, hey, with a bit of luck, we might have something to show at the end of the month. Cool. Let's do it. <laughs> that with a bit of luck phrase has been going around today. I've heard that <laughs> um, previously on this call. And um, luck is a good thing to have on your side. Smart luck. I like to think of it. Smart luck. Mm -hmm. it, it's what fuels often innovation. 
Yeah, the more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> There's, there is that element of it, but it's also <laughs> it's also being at the right place at the right time. There's a sort of luck element there. And I think our chain is at the right place at the right time. And COVID is that time. It's not COVID. It's the reason why it's now and it wasn't in March is because there wasn't any talk of having a vaccine. Now there is. So now there's the need and there's a need for this decentralized registry um, that um, that everyone can use where it's not owned by a nation state or any organization uh, because of and, the trust. And, keep, and keeping the data on chain is also critical. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to say, Greg, I know that we only have about three minutes left, but I wanted to say how much I really love the new Dazzle logo. Oh, good. I saw your response, I think, on Twitter. I find it to be very vibrant and enjoyable to look at. Oh, good, good. (laughs) I've got one question for you, Nora, before we go. Uh, I well remember you posting a picture uh, during the primaries uh, of you and Kamala Harris. Yes. If you wrote her an email, do you think she'd read it? Um, I don't have her email. Um, <laughs> I can contact some people that worked with her during the campaign, possibly. Um, I, I believe that she's reachable in some way, shape or form um, because they haven't taken office yet and it seems like they're very eager to listen to a lot of different perspectives and information but I don't have her personal email um I wish I did but I do think that she is a reachable person right now right. For sure. so we we would like to give her this potential global initiative you know if this comes off Right. We get a demo. We get to demonstrate some key individuals in in the the appropriate scientific medical communities. Um, And it looks like, hey, this is looking pretty good. We want to make sure she knows. Because I think that that her and and Joe Biden, you know, they're going to have a hard time um, through COVID. And anything that we can do to make that the messaging that they put out, uh, you know, more positive, um uh and trustworthy the better yeah well let's talk about that um let's definitely talk about that and um unfortunately we have less than a minute left but i want to say thank you to everybody who is listening to this in the future which is the now for you and the past also (laughs) um um so thank you all so much and um Please uh, subscribe to our chain on uh, YouTube and follow us on uh, all our social media. And um, if you'd like to be a guest on uh, this call, you can email climate at rchain.coop and you can become a member at rchain.coop. So thank you all so much. This was great. Great. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you all. Ciao, ciao. Bye.